My name, is, uh, as Will says, is Mike Loginov, and uh, from the dulcet Scottish tones, you can guess where I'm from. Bit of a giveaway there, right? So, um, we're going to have a look here at the art and science of social engineering and human hacking. Now, let me just explain within the context of what I'm speaking to you about, what the difference between the art and the science is. The science is really about looking at patterns, the sort of A, B, C, one, two, three steps to doing something and doing it effectively and efficiently for the purpose for which we're talking about here. Once we've got the science cracked, then the art really comes in, and that's really about timing, the use of techniques, and the creativity that we can bring to the sort of stuff I'll be sharing with you this afternoon. So, um, just to point out, and I'm getting my signal here, that so we are recording this today, for, uh, but you won't be on on screen, I'm told. It's just me up front here, so all the pressure's on me. Um, so, the art and science of social engineering and human hacking. Now, I'm not going to focus on pure negativity in this. I could. We could get quite negative in terms of how it's used. There's actually a lot of positive things that we'll use every day in our social lives <coughs> on things like interviewing techniques, presenting. These are all techniques that are widely used, and uh, Will, in his little introduction there was noticed was using some some of the stuff I'll be talking about. I'm going to talk about charisma for example and business charisma and what does that mean. So first exercise if you just might like to think of somebody who you can think of perhaps a manager, a leader, a personality, a friend, whoever who you might consider to be a charismatic individual and just think what does that actually mean to you? What makes them charismatic? And we'll talk about how that fits into the context of social engineering as we go through this. Okay, so, yep, that's what it's all about. Hacking the human, human computer. Uh, so we'll do a short video, uh, by the way, which has a bit of flashing imagery in it as well. So if anybody is uh, subject to uh, any, any angst around that, probably a good time to leave now. It's a short video. It lasts about 30, 35 seconds. Uh, quick blast of, of some key points. We'll talk about who does social engineering, why they do it, and a little bit about how they do it. Uh, and then I'll give you a real, a real example of where all these components come together into the types of hacking that I do into organizations um, in order to demonstrate these skills to organizations. And at the end of all that, you get the, the chance to, to ask uh, both Will and myself some questions. So feel free to uh, garner a few as we run through the presentation and uh, look forward to coming to, to those points at the end. <coughs>
Okay, so just a few key words there that we'll come back to, and one or two of those we'll uh, delve into a little bit deeper. But quick 30 seconds just to get uh, some key phrases and words into the old brain cells there for you. A um, little bit on my background, profile of a social engineer is what it says, but that uh, profile can be very wide and varied. As we say, that's uh, something that a lot of us use all of the time, actually, perhaps without really calling that or recognizing it as such. But a little bit more on my background and uh, my credentials, really, for standing up here and doing this sort of stuff. Uh, I'm 10 years former military, military intelligence. I did a lot of work with CEOP, which is the uh, Child Environment Online Protection Agency, catching bad guys online, uh, part of the National Crime Agency. Now, um, I was in central government for a while, and former chief cyber strategist with, with Hewlett Packard. So lots of uh, industry, frontline, operational stuff, really. And uh, these days, I'm uh, the uh, vice chairman of the National MBA in cybersecurity, which uh, the bank is supporting. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that. Uh, company, company secretary for the ISSA, which is about 10,000 member organization uh, across the world of uh, intelligence and security professionals. Maybe one or two in the audience. Hopefully there are. If there aren't, please join. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also founder and CEO of the Ascot Barclay Group, which specializes in cybersecurity and uh, helping organizations defend against sort of stuff that we're talking about today. Um, perhaps more inter interestingly, uh, I'm a certified, uh, certified chief information security officer, a social engineering auditor, which means I go in typically after a breach has happened in some instances to identify how those guys actually managed to get in and do what they did in order to breach the organization. And uh, if we think about some of the large breaches that I'm sure you've seen in the news, places like Target, Sony Entertainment, um, Home Depot, mainly North American <coughs> companies because they have to disclose we find that a lot of those big major hacks started with social engineering, actually finding an individual, compromising that individual or a group of individuals. Okay, so a bit more on that as we go. Uh, I'm a neuro-linguistic practitioner. I'm also a, a master hypnotist, which I was told not to mention today because it would scare the sh out of you. Um, but there we go, done it now. <laughs> Uh, and uh, sports psychologist for, for 10 years. So I trained uh, three professional world champions. So that whole psyche piece of uh, championships, winning and getting results is really one of my key drivers. But my main education through all of this stuff and really what brings me here today is the fact that I myself was a victim of a social engineering scam. Um, it's a few years ago now when... Uh, eBay first came out. I thought I'd be clever and put uh, a lot of stuff on there. Uh, my wife, or I should say former wife, a bit of a clue in this, uh, had a jewelry company and we decided to sell a lot of samples, you know, gold, silver, and uh, some precious stones, etc. So to get rid of them quickly, I put them on eBay. Got loads of phone calls from around the world. Um, one from France, which sounded great, one from Italy, one from Russia, I thought I'm not going to Russia, um, for whatever reason at that time. And we agreed, and I spoke to the actual people on the other end who said they were interested and wanted to buy it. And they said, yeah, money's there to be transferred, it's a great deal, we want to do it, blah, blah, blah. An escrow account was set up, very professional, all the money was transferred into the Estro account. I phoned up to check that was all legitimate. You're ahead of me already, right? Um, and of course, next day, I, when I transferred all this stuff down to Italy, as it happened, um, next day afterwards, no money. All the sites went down, nothing there. I was short of, uh, well, somewhere north of 50,000 pounds. So 50 grand which was quite an educational lesson. You know, I think you can do an MBA or two for that uh, these days. Um, so yeah, major lesson for me. And really, that really taught me to sit down and look at how did they really do this? How did they catch me? I, you know, I'm not stupid. Perhaps I was. Perhaps I was naive at that time, certainly. Um, and I'd been in security prior to that as well, so we're all human. And, um, you know, on, on losing 
my former wife's jewellery. That kind of was the last straw, right? So it had some implications from different uh, perspectives over and above losing a bit of cash. So a sharp lesson, we shall see. So a few questions uh, that uh, I just want to, to ask the audience now. We'll ask probably, well, three questions actually throughout the... Uh, throughout this short presentation. So you do have these little white clicker boxes, uh, little control panels. Um, and in a second, a timer will come up which will give you a few seconds to think about an answer. And really, what I'd like to know is, is it just me? Am I the only one that, in a room of this size, with this many people, have uh, suffered from a cyber attack? Uh, issue like that or being compromised. You know, you may have a, had a credit card stolen, you may have been, you know, your identity perhaps stolen, or you may know somebody who has. So have you actually experienced a direct attack like that yourself? Uh, or do you know a family member or a friend? Or you have and you know somebody? So three, three options for yes, really. Uh, and one for no. You're the only one, Mike. It's never happened to any of us. You know, you're clearly an idiot, and that's the, the matter ended. So if you'd like to just uh, vote now, I'd be very grateful, please. Okay, thank you, Alex. Are you going to show us the results now, I think? Or is it me to click? Oh, we have a technical issue. Might have to try that again, folks. Have we got the results, Alex? Oh, thank you very much. Well done. So, quite a spread there. So, we've got, well, what's 69% uh, of the audience saying yes, they either have themselves <laughs> being. Uh, attacked or compromised in some way, with only 31% saying they don't know anybody or it's never happened to them. There's time. <laughs> Keep using that internet. Catch up with the rest of us. It will happen. But be careful. Okay, great. Interesting stat. I had no idea what was going to come up, but that's, I guess, fairly typical as to what we'd find uh, across uh, an audience. So, cool stuff. All right, let's uh, delve a little bit deeper now. Let's have a look at the, the tools and tricks of the social engineer and, and what's it really all about. So it's really about the, the deliberate um, attempt to use techniques to elicit information. Um, or indeed, it may be to get somebody to take an action that puts the organization or themselves in a position of jeopardy. So that's the goal and the aim, really, of, uh, of the, the social engineer. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit on nonverbal communication. These are the tricks. Uh, we'll cover a little bit on some of the tools that are used and some of the devices that are used as well. Some of you may, you may be aware of, others you may not be. So I mentioned uh, business charisma earlier on. Um, and one of the things that uh, we as social engineers like to do is to use a little bit of charismatic uh, influence over the people that we're seeking to, um, to get to do something, you know, perhaps that they wouldn't normally do. So I'm going to talk about charisma. So if you've got somebody in mind who is a, perhaps a great presenter or a friend or somebody that's a personality, just what are the key traits that they have that makes them charismatic? It's a great word, charismatic, isn't it? If you look it up uh, on Wikipedia, um, you know, Wikipedia says, and I paraphrase a little bit, a gift from God. <laughs> but what we find is when we look at charismatic people and the way that they react, respond, and do, there are patterns that they're following that make them come over and appear that way. And so we're just looking at learning from those particular patterns. So charismatic people. Here's a couple of examples, and uh, these uh, were from an audience of, of another group that... Uh, that I asked, you know, tell me or name me a charismatic person, and anybody know who that guy is? Steve Jobs, I hear you all say. Well done. 
Um, yeah, Steve Jobs, uh, great charismatic presenter. His presentations were well renowned. And uh, again, using techniques, he was well trained, well groomed in using some of the stuff I'm actually going to talk to you about in a few minutes. But there are others that come up quite regularly Branson, Winston Churchill, Bill Gates, you know, big names. Einstein's always an interesting one. Um, but there's one thing that all of these guys have in common, and that is they're all dyslexic as well. It's quite interesting. Why? I don't know, but they're all dyslexic. So. Here's a little test for you. How many of you can read that? And it makes sense. Quite a lot of the audience, right? Well, again, I put this up because it's actually a little trick that, again, as social engineers, we use when we come to compromising um, email addresses. So, for example, if I just use Kimber and her last name, and I use the K and uh, Bennett, the T at the end, and mix the other words up, I can use passwords in different ways. And your brain will reorganize that. You know who Kimber is, for, for example, let's say. And so it's quite a neat little trick that we use to um, get past and use something that looks familiar, but isn't really. Okay. Doesn't mean you're dyslexic, by, by the way, like me, if you can read that. So just put your mind at rest on that one. <laughs> so here's, a, here's another interesting thing. Um, how many of you have heard of the term corporate fat cats? Yeah, it's, it's quite a well-known term, right? Corporate fat cats. Well, there's a bit of um, science behind that. Um, and I'm going to use the analogy of cats and dogs, really, just to make a point, um, because it's something we can all relate to. Now, we find that the higher up the corporate ladder we go, the more cat-like behavior we see. So if anybody's got a cat at home, you could describe what that cat is like. You know, if you've got a dog, if you feed a dog, what happens? It's grateful usually, isn't it? Thank you, master. <laughs> Dives straight in and gobbles it all up. The cat is much more aloof. It sits back, it ponders. I might eat it, I might not. <laughs> you know, it's my choice. I'm the boss here. And uh, so they display a different kind of behavior. And as I say, the higher up the corporate ladder we go, the more cat-like behavior we see. Um, and this comes across in things like body language and the interactions that we're having with people. And interestingly, this is handy to know when you're speaking to an audience, by the way. If you can identify within the audience who the cats are and who the dogs are, then... <laughs> it becomes a good way of presenting to certain key areas. And we'll talk a little bit more about the key identifiers between those two things in a second. So, let's have a look at the characteristics of a dog. They're approachable. They're friendly. They want to please. You know, they want to be your friend. Yeah, yeah, and that's nice. You know, they're great people to be around, the dogs. And most of us, by the way, are dogs or display dog behavior more than cat behavior, but we can all display extremes of both, given the circumstances. Okay, um, The cats like to be credible, it's a key word. They like to be independent, uh, it's really about what's in it for me, and uh, they'll sit back in their chairs, and it's impressed me. The dogs tend to lean forward a little bit and engage from that perspective. Okay, So when I'm looking at my audience, who do you think I need to please first? If you're having to pick one group, the cats in the audience or the dogs in the audience, who am I pleasing first? The cats. Well done, sir. 10 out of 10. The cats. Why? Because the dogs are on your side anyway. Okay, They're on the side of the presenter. They want you to do well. The cats are, please me. So if you please the cats, the dogs are happy. All right. Why am I saying all this? Because as a social engineer going into an organization, I need to identify who it is I'm talking to so that I can communicate accordingly and press the right buttons. Okay, cats, by the way, are impressed by intelligence. So if you can look and come across and appear intelligent, then they'll take you much more seriously. Handshakes, simple things like handshakes tell us a great deal. Would you mind volunteering again? Thanks. So if, uh, if I go to, to shake hands like that, 
we can see that's a neutral kind of handshake. All right, both the thumbs are up. However, if you were an aggressive salesman, you might like to shake my hand like that. So much more domineering position. So that's a very cat-like handshake, and I'm obviously being subservient in this case uh, and taking that uh, side there. So if you ever come across a very dominant sales guy, here's the way to disarm that very aggressive approach, okay? So we go like this. I just go... <laughs> you ought to see their faces. It's great. <laughs> so, palm down, dog, approachable, friendly. Pa uh, sorry, palm down, that's uh, more cat-like. Palm up is, is a dog-like dog approach. And again, social engineering. How do I want to position myself? Sometimes I want to be subservient if I'm trying to manipulate a situation. Other times I want to be dominant. Just do it. I'm telling you. Okay, I'm the boss. Time for you to do what you're told. Tell me what your password is. Open that door for me. Give me that information. We're all good at reading body language, okay? It's something we do naturally. And you can guess a few kind of scenarios from this one, I guess. Could be that there's a bit of a bad smell around, but let's assume it's not that one. He's got a very expressive face, Obama. Um, and... Uh, you know, we have Putin here, and this was during the G20, and, and one of the things I do is analysis of politicians and, and people like this during uh, trials and, and various things on, on the nonverbal intelligence. One of the things that went on to happen here is that <coughs> Obama put his hand out to shake with Putin, and Obama did this, and Putin did this, and it was very obvious and very evident but the other interesting thing about it, and I do have some pictures, but we didn't have time to show them today, is that they didn't actually look each other in the eye as this was taking place. They were watching their hands, and it was like slow motion. So Putin was coming in. And Obama was. And it was a bit surreal. It really was. But submissive and dominant, and you could really see the difference in the two. And I just wonder what the discussion was about. I've got no idea. Hopefully it was something like, what are we having for tea tonight? And uh, yeah, <laughs> you win. So interesting stuff. Now, I mentioned eye contact there. Eye contact is, again, really interesting stuff. We're all, all generally overtrained in the use of eye contact. But essentially, there are four points of focus that we use. And again, this is for sleight of hand type stuff. Magicians use this. Social engineers use this in order to manipulate situations again. So the first um, point of focus is clearly is looking down like that. And interestingly, if you watch news readers on the TV, they've got their auto cues up there, right? And they don't need to look down, but they do. So they'll give you a piece of news, and then they'll look down. They might shuffle their notes, and then they'll look up. Why? Because it's a natural stop in the flow. They're letting the audience know, I've finished that one, I'm now moving to the next one. Okay? Don't have to do it, because the auto cue is there, and they can go straight through. But could you imagine what that's like? Okay, nothing to give you a break. So we use points of focus to, again, communicate in a specific way. The second one is uh, two points, and apologies for the graphics here, by the way. Okay, I know they're a little bit... Um, uh, gimmicky, but uh, it was the best I could come up with. Um, <clears throat> so the second one is eye-to-eye -eye contact. Again, the one that we're all highly trained in. So this is two-point. So looking somebody directly in the eyes. And again, it's appropriate to do that for some things and inappropriate for other things. <laughs> Here's an example of three-point. Now, three-point is where I use um, whatever it might be, a piece of paper, a device, a flip chart, a presentation screen, that's a third point. So why is that important? Well, one particular use of this is if I'm presenting information that is negative, do I want to be looking you in the eye when I'm giving you that information? Not really. Why? Because I'm anchoring that message with me as a personality. So I don't want to be doing that. I don't want to go home at night with uh, all that negative on my back. So I'll use a third point. So, for example, if, uh, if uh, we were doing a, an appraisal, let's say, um, and I'll just borrow you a piece of paper here. 
So if I'm saying, look, okay, you've been late three times this week. Uh, you've been late three times this week, and indeed, um, that's not terribly good because HR are on my back. And you know, what is it we're going to do about it? Then I've anchored that negativity here. And afterwards, I can go, look, we really need to sort this out. Okay, let's have a chat. What are we going to do about it? And we get into the personal stuff. So I anchor the negative stuff in something that is immaterial. And I can do the same with a flip chart or some other kind of device. Um, and the last one really is, is somewhere outside of the room. So we might use the analogy, look, you know, outside in the, it's, it's absolutely raining buckets and dogs this afternoon out there. Um, so it's good that we're all sat in here and enjoying uh, this, this uh, session. Okay, so that's out of the room, fourth point. And these are all key, again, when I'm seeking to manipulate a situation. Okay, I'm conscious of time. So positive interactions, use two-point, make that connection. You're going to get a pay rise. It's going to be huge, and uh, you'll love it. Okay? <laughs> no eye contact. <laughs> no eye. All right, voice patterns are very key as well. So... Cats like to be credible, intelligent, so they'll use a voice pattern that runs along like this and then drops off at the end. If you think of an Australian speaking, typical Australian speaking, it's kind of very musical, right? And it bobs up at the end, okay? And that is more approachable. Um, we had that comedian, uh, you know, that was on TV for a while doing all the stuff with the kids, you know. Um, was it, uh, I'm a bothered, I'm a bothered, I don't know if any of your kids were starting to use that. I mean, mine were at one stage, and it was, please don't do that. Because if you're going for an interview, and you're going, I'm bothered, or using that up tone, it's not credible. It's not good. So don't use that. Um, the cats tend to stand with a still head when they're speaking, and the dogs are nodding in approval and agreement. And thank you for those dogs out there doing this, because everybody's trying to sit there going, yeah. Um, Intonation, so curls up, curls down. Just watch out. A lot of um, people who are working in call centers use that very approachable, friendly, musical tone. Um, so, good. Palms up, palms down, we've done. So, second question then. What do you suspect social engineering is most commonly used for? So, Alex, uh, when you're ready, we'll uh, go for this one. So, six options this time. Um, again, it's only a straw poll, it's not that scientific, so don't worry too much about it, but just what is your inclination as to how social engineering is most widely used? Is it for security breaches, networking, meaning social interaction type stuff, making friends, um, or making more friends, and the socialising, the actual use of it over a glass of bubbly or whatever, corporate espionage, career development, or maybe all of the above? Can we start the timer, Alex? Fabulous, and do we have a score? I feel like Bruce Forsyth doing this. Wow. All of the above, yeah, great. That's cool. Security breach, 5%. Networking, 13 Socializing, 17 Corporate espionage actually is used quite a lot in corporate espionage because all the social engineering techniques that we're talking about to breach big companies are, are obviously used there as well. So I would have probably went myself for all of the above. So uh, congratulations to those 58% of you who did that. Always appeal to the biggest part of the audience, right, if you're a politician. Okay, great. So we talked earlier on about uh, espionage. Um, and this is something that happens at an industrial scale. <coughs> Now, we've had comments coming out of the U.S. from Obama's um, cyber secretary saying that there have been terabytes and petabytes of data hoovered out of organizations over many years. So that's all our private personal information that's sucked up and used and stored somewhere for what purposes. So again, here you'll see words deception, uh, persuading, orchestrated, all social engineering type words that we've seen on the, the short video. So a big issue for a lot of organizations. So use of uh, social engineering to breach an organization. My strategy is I want to give you something you're familiar with from somebody that you're familiar with. 
If I can do that, then the chances of you clicking on something are much, much higher. Uh, I want to build trust and rapport, and um, you know, really using this to, to gather information to exploit uh, with open source intelligence and human intelligence type stuff. So if it was hacking the bank, three ways for me to get in. Physical entry, but you've got some big security guards at the front door. But we can't get past those in certain ways at certain times. Um, we can breach your processes, your policies, or we can compromise the organization from a digital perspective, cyber attack. But I'm always going to start here. Always the best place for me to start. If I can compromise an individual, then all the billions of pounds that are spent around the world and all this big, heavy security technology can be sidetracked very easily through the compromise of one individual. And that has happened to the detriment of many big organizations. So the dull moments, we can all have them. Here's a quick, uh, a very quick introduction to uh, an exercise that we conducted for a large <coughs> company that shall remain nameless. But they had the very best security on the front doors. We managed to compromise that. In fact, they had um, uh, a police cordon around the building during the G20 when I managed to compromise their, uh, their building. Uh, I did that with a badge that I created that morning with sellotape around it, which doesn't look too unlike the ones that you're wearing today with my photograph on it. But I did do a silly photograph you know, like this because I did want to get caught. Um, and the name of the badge was Max Hacker. Bit of a giveaway, right? Did I get stopped? I didn't get stopped by the cops. I didn't get stopped by internal security. And uh, managed to get up onto one of the secure floors, plant some electronic devices, which are tiny little things, um, you know, this size, in the back of uh, their PCs, which transmit information out, key loggers, that sort of stuff, very useful. Great things to stick in places like uh, libraries on the computers that are uh, used in libraries. Stick one of those things in the back. It's amazing the personal information I can collect as a social engineer and hacker from those types of environments. Um, and it's all about collecting intelligence. I'll walk around. I'll follow you. If you wear your badge out of the building, please do. I love that as a social engineer because I can follow you down the road into the cafe, sit down, listen to what you're saying, record conversations. We do all of this. We video things. Um, this little device here is my best friend. You know, I, I was standing in a reception the other day with uh, a couple of guys sat in the front here. Uh, I was stood behind here. He was going through some commercial documents, and I was just with my video on there, videoing his, his screen, an executive, capturing all of that data on my little device. Nobody bats an eyelid, because we're all using them all of the time, and all I was doing was texting, right? Wrong. I was videoing everything that was on his screen. Just be conscious, that's all. Um, so, oh, and the other thing was social engineering a member of staff. And we used phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks to do that. So what's that? Well, um, different, different types of approach. Phishing is email. Vishing is calling them up on the telephone and asking for some information. Smishing is text messaging. All of these things have uh, great names, don't they? And uh, impersonation, not my specs, by the way, there, but... Uh, Use there. So 60% of people we ask, um, we phone up and we say, look, it's time to change your password. We've had a security breach. I'm Mike from the IT department. Can you please use this password and put it in? Have you done that yet? Yes. Great. Okay. We'll call you back in a few days' time and give you a new one. Is that okay? Yes. Done. Move on. 60% success rate in doing that. Sounds daft, doesn't it? But dogs... They love to do what uh, we ask them to do. 67% give more information. Dates of birth, uh, employee number. But we have a 100% success ratio in, in physical breach of an organization. Okay? Over time, it takes time. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of uh, research and a lot of surveillance and observation. But that's what we do. If an organization is worth hacking and cracking, we'll spend the time doing it. It will spend the time to find a way in to that organization. Spear phishing, uh, great. I might go to the golf club, live, listening to an executive's conversation, send them an email saying, you know, um, you were mentioning you're off on holiday to XYZ or you're just about to buy a new 
Jaguar, and I'll send him an email that's very personal and very specific with regards to topics that I know he's interested in and has been talking about. That's how detailed we get. So targeted emails, a um, couple of ways of doing it. We can uh, get to a web link, send you to a fake site. Uh, that's not so common these days. This is much more common, where we'll send you a malformed document, which we want you to click on, download a payload, we're in. Okay. Uh, we do that. You know, Not all mail we send out is malicious. So this one would come from somebody that uh, you would probably look at the email and think, as I said earlier, with somebody mm -hmm. you know. It's a joke, you know, um, there's nothing malicious in this whatsoever. But the trick here is for me to get you to respond to this, and then of course to send you something that said, well, if you like that one, here's something really funny. And click on this link and download this fantastic video image, which you'll really enjoy. And of course, that's the link we want you to download, and away you go. The, the former, by the way, on these things, the success rate on, on uh, non-spear phishing is something like zero. 0.01%. It's quite low. It's not very effective. With this form of uh, phishing, spear phishing, we get 10 to 70% to success rates. Okay. It's quite high. Planting devices I've mentioned. These are small things. Stick them in the back of the computer. Just not something that people would generally notice. Key grabbers, Wi-Fi, transmit information back out. We're sat outside picking all that information up. Next question, What's, what aspects of social engineering would you, uh, would you perhaps like to learn more about? Which sounds more interesting? Something personal, something corporate, up to you. So thank you, uh, Alex, again, if we can start the voting on that one. Okay, the hacker mindset is, yeah, definitely very interesting. Hopefully you're getting some insights from, uh, from, from myself on that aspect today. I run teams of these guys and I've run them for years. Um, interesting stuff. Uh, career and leadership, yeah, great stuff. If, you know, if these bad guys can use it for nefarious means, we can use it for good means as well. So it's great to see that coming up. So in summary then, points to remember. The threats from social engineers like myself, whether we're doing it for an organization and on behalf of an organization to <coughs> highlight and make people aware of the type of activities that the real bad guys do, then they're out there doing it. We like to plant electronic devices. You've had some examples of that. We love to collect information, intelligence, whatever information. Little snippets, grains of sand. Over time, we build up a picture. So everything is useful. Everything has a value on the dark web. All information has a value to it. So yeah, we, we love uh, to social, our, social engineer our way into organizations, um, but key points to remember, you are really the first line of defense. If I can't get past you, I can't get into an organization. So really down to yourself. So very happy. <laughs>